It is good to be here this morning. Um, Matt and I, uh, our dear friends, Matt is probably one of my closest pastor friends. He is a great encouragement to me. Um, I, between services, just as a little treat and a little gift for him, I rearranged his office by author's middle name alphabetically. So that'll be a nice treat coming back from his, uh, his sabbatical. Uh, but I, I just want to thank y'all uh, for giving your pastor a sabbatical and loving him well. Uh, I'm the pastor out at Ocean Park Baptist Church, out at the beach. Matt and I have been uh, and this pastor at the same amount. I, I think I got to Ocean Park maybe six months before he came here. Uh, just to see y'all's growth and love in the gospel um, has been an encouragement. But pastoral ministry is really hard. And to love your pastor well, to allow him this time uh, to be able to go refresh, refocus, renew, and come back uh, for this next season of growth uh, and encouragement, uh, I'm thank you uh, to doing that. Now, if you see any of my people, just be like, give Pastor Chris a sabbatical ne- I'm, I'm next summer. Uh, so, you know, that's, and I'll, I'll hook you up after. Um, we're gonna, this morning, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 46. And why Isaiah 46? Well, when Joseph reached out to me a couple weeks ago and says, hey, any idea what you're going to be preaching on? It's just what I preached on the, the week earlier. Uh, at Ocean Park, we've been going through the book of Isaiah. The middle section, Isaiah itself, is broken up into three parts. 1 through 39, and you can see it's very heavy, it's woe and judgment and, uh, on the nations. But then this middle section in 40 through 55, you see it's God's message to the exiles that the prophet has written and compiled. The exiles go into captivity, Isaiah dies, and they come back and find this treasure of the promises of God. Uh, and so Isaiah 46 is where we land today. Uh, If you're not already there, please turn there, and if you would stand for the reading of God's Word. Bell bows down, Nebo stoops. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These things you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. They stoop, they bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves go into captivity. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel, who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And to the gray hairs, I will carry you. I have made you, and I will bear, I will carry, and will save. To whom will you liken me and make me equal and compare me that we may be alike? Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, hire a goldsmith and make it into a god. Then they fall down and worship. They lift it up on their shoulders, they carry it, they set it in place and stand there. It cannot move from it. If one cries to it, it does not answer, or does it save them from his trouble? Remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me. Declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times, things not done. Saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose. Calling a bird of prey from the east, a man of counsel from a far country, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purpose and I will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn of hearts, you who are far from righteousness. Bring near my righteous. Is it not far off? And my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion for Israel, my glory. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, you are good and you are great. And Father, though you are creator of heaven and earth, you are a God who is near to your people. You're a God who has made promises, and you have loved and made those promises. You will care. And Father, we confess that often, though we have your promises, and though we have seen how you have worked in our lives, our hearts grow weary, our hearts grow anxious, and we turn, as the hymn writer said, we're prone to wander, Lord, we feel it, prone to leave the God we love. But you are a God who leaves the 99 in the safety of the, she- uh, of the sheepfold and, ch- and go after the one. And Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace, that you're slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love. 
I pray that you would give all of us eyes to see your glory and the beauty of Christ. Ears to hear your truth and the sweetness of the song of the gospel. And hearts that burn for your glory and hearts that desire to draw near to our God that calls them to ourselves. In the name above all things, Jesus Christ, we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Please be seated. Dr. Carolyn Chen is an associate professor at UC Berkeley, and she is the director of the Berkeley Center for the Study of Religion. And between 2013 and 2018, she interviewed about 100 people for a book she was writing called Work, Pray, Code, When Work Becomes Religion in Silicon Valley. One of her interviews was a woman named Taylor, and she writes, it says, Taylor quickly soared up the ranks of her company. Like many of the people uh, we spoke to, Taylor also poured herself into her company, working about 70 to hour, 80 hours a week, eating all her work, meals at work, and limiting her social circle to co-workers until her whole life orbited around her startup company. Taylor, like so many others in startups, had faith um, that her devotion would be rewarded when the anticipated corporate acquisition went through and her company's value and her hard work would be recognized. But when the acquisition fell through, it broke her heart, she said. I couldn't do do it anymore, so I left. Taylor spiraled into a year-long existential crisis that she called a death of self. Taylor depended on her work for her full identity and meaning so that when she left her job, she didn't even know who she was anymore. Who am I? What do I value, she asked herself. I didn't even know these things because I gave everything up for my work With a sense of self so tied to her company's performance, the failed acquisition revealed the poverty of a worldview that reduces value down to dollars and to cents. Brothers and sisters, Taylor's not alone. And many people in Silicon Valley, Dr. Chen noticed, that their career, they called their career spiritual journeys and their work was a calling. However, Chen's research revealed a very bleak worldview in a very bleak picture. She wrote in a New York Times op-ed, the gospel of work is thin gruel. It is an ethically empty solution to meet our essential need for belonging and meaning, and it's starving us as individuals and communities. Community Bible, as we open up the book of Isaiah today, I don't think all of us are that much different than this young woman named Taylor. We may not be pouring ourselves into our work, but we're pouring ourselves into something. And as St. Augustine said and confessed at when he had gone through so much, he says, we, you have created us for ourselves and we are restless until we rest in you. Isaiah is calling us this morning to recognize that the idols of work or the idols of wood cannot give us meaning, nor the counterfeit gods of Babylon, of Silicon Valley, of New York City, or of Jacksonville cannot satisfy us. Brothers and sisters, my big idea that I want you to know today is this. The Lord alone can carry the weight of your life. The Lord alone can carry the weight of your life. And Isaiah and Isaiah 46 calls us to three things. He says, first, abandon worthless idols. Second, trust the eternal God. And third, remember God's salvation. Abandon worthless gods, trust the eternal God, and remember God's salvation. Every year at the Babylonian New Year Festival, the god Nebo would come, and from and his followers would take Nebo, and this is Nebo, uh, he's joining us today via satellite, uh, from his temple in Borshippa, which is southwest of Babylon, and he would be carried along with his father, Bel Marduk, through the streets to the great in uh, Esca, I messed it up last time too, this great shrine in Babylon, we're going to call it. 
and it would, they would fill the streets overflowed with revelers as they celebrated the provisions of their god Nebo and Marduk for Babylon. It had all the pomp and circumstances of the Queen of England. And you see this, and this is the background, this is the cultural backdrop for this vision, this alternative, alternative vision that Isaiah gives us in 46, 1 and 2. Notice these, those words. Bell bows down. Nebo stoops. Their idols are on beasts and livestock. These carry things are, you carry are born as burdens on weary beasts. And notice what happens. They stoop. They bow down together. They cannot save the burden, but themselves are being led into captivity. Uh, Isaiah 46 shows us a very different picture of Bel and Nebo's procession in this inspired vision of Isaiah. Bel and Nebo are not being lifted up and carried to the shrine. Instead, they are bowed down and stoop low. They're too heavy, and the animals that they're carrying are ex- or that are carrying them are exhausted, and so much so that the idols stagger and they fall down. Instead of uh, progressing, to, uh, pr- processing to the great shrine for worship, they are being and stumbling and bumbling their way into captivity themselves. If you had been with us for the last few weeks in Isaiah, and you can join and read along if you'd like, but Isaiah once again is pounding this drumbeat that idols cannot carry the weight of their, our lives. They will inevitably bow and stoop and fall and come crashing down. In fact, idols can't carry our weights, but they can't even carry their own weights. They require their worshipers to prop them up and carry them on their shoulders, or put them on beasts to carry them in procession. All the while, they're leading their worshipers into captivity. Brothers and sisters, all idols will always disappoint you, oftentimes destructively so. Modern readers, as we go through, say, Chris, listen, I, I get it. Idolatry was a really big problem in the ancient world. But this is the 21st century. We're in 2022. Uh, I, I don't have uh, idols or statues of gods in my house or in my communities who I turn to for wisdom and protection and affirmation and pro- uh, provision, but in reality, our hearts are just as idolatrous. We're just far more sophisticated in our idolatry. Tim Keller, in his book Counterfeit Gods, shines a light on the heart condition that creates idols. He says this An idol is anything more important to you than God, anything that absorbs your heart and your imagination more than God, anything you seek to give you what you God can only give. I want you to think about this, that this morning. What do you do when your cell phone dies and you don't have a charger and you can't charge your cell phone up to distract you when you're sitting in car line or you're waiting for at the doctor's office or, or you're waiting for a meeting at work? Uh, what are you thinking about when your phone can't distract you and amuse you? What do you think about? What does your imagination go to? How do you daydream? Keller says it's not just statues of uh, Babylonian gods that are idols, there's sometimes there's good things. Most of the time, idols are made into good things. He says, family and children, passions and energies, emotional or financial resources, career or money-making, achievement or critical acclaim, saving face or social standing, peer approval and acceptance, competence and skill, security and comfort, beauty or brains, political or social causes, uh, morality or virtue, even as Joseph and Matt and myself can attain, success in Christian ministry can be an idol that leads us away from the one true God. You see, idols, when you take a good thing and make it an ultimate thing, it becomes 
a worthless thing because it moves you away from devotion to the one true God who you were created to find your meaning and your satisfaction and eternal joy in. An idol is whatever you look at and say in your heart, if I have it, then my life will have meaning. And you'll know I'll have value, and then I'll significant and secure. And if I lose it, my life is not worth living. Community Bible, I want you to think, what do you struggle with idolatry with? Now, you might be able to identify what your spouse studies, uh, struggles with idolatry, or your children, or your parents, or your coworkers, but that doesn't matter. What do you struggle with in idolatry? We're not all tempted by idolatry in all the same way, but as Calvin says, our, idols are, our hearts are idol factories. Your idol may not be Me- Nebo, the god of wisdom, or Marduk, the god of agriculture and medicine. Your idol may be the Republican or, no- or Democratic nominee who you think will protect you from those people. Your God may be the God of fitness or diet who will protect you from cancer or heart disease or death. Your idol may be be a carved statue you pray to for wisdom, a person whose administration opposes the people you despise, or even a good thing like a spouse, a child, a country, a job, or a ministry. Whoever or whatever you look to for happiness, for meaning and identity, other than the one true God, maker of heaven and earth, cannot carry the weight of your life. They simply were not designed to do that. It will crush them. Even the best of people will be crushed because they are not designed to carry the weight of the significance of your life Only the shoulders of Jesus Christ are strong enough to carry the significance of your life. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah is calling his readers and he's calling you and I this morning to identify and abandon worthless gods for the Lord alone can carry the weight of our life. Therefore, abandon worthless gods and trust the eternal God. Trust the eternal God. There's an inevitable progress for people experience from infancy to old age. It's the slow reversal of the parent-child relationship. The, parent, the child, for the better part of 18 years, moves from fully dependent on their parents to be fully independent from their parents. Uh, Denise and I have learned that over the last few years as a couple weeks ago, Anna uh, got engaged to Stone. Uh, who attends here, if you see Stone from now on, just glare at him uh, on my behalf. Uh, no, he, he's a, we're, we're, it's a joy, and we're very, very proud to have Stone as a son-in-law. And then uh, Andrew has gone off, and he's been at school in the Midwest, and, and so it's hard, it's grieving as we watch these children grow. Once we're little ones that we could pick up and say, sit in the corner until I tell you to get up, and now they are ch- pursuing their dreams, and we are uh, st- staying at home, And nobody prepared us for this, to watch our children pursue their dreams. All the while, there comes a time in a parent's life where the parents grow more dependent on their children for provision and assistance and protection, even to the point of living in their own home. I've watched the same thing as my father, when I was a little boy, was a picture of strength. He could literally pick up everything, anything, and I watched in amazement at his strength, and now as an older man, he's anxious and weak and more dependent on my, my, myself and my wife, and it's this hard. Nobody prepares you for these types of things because time and tide wait for no one. No one is exempt from the effects. Each one of us feels the weight of time washing over us and our constant need for security and significant and purpose. But the question is, where do you turn when you feel your weakness, when you're anxious, when you're fearful, when you're scared? Isaiah says there is only one place, verse 3 and 4. Listen to me, O house of Jacob, all the remnant of the house of Israel who have been born by me from before your birth, carried from the womb, even to your old age, I am he. And to gray hairs, I will carry you. Isaiah tells us that the only God 
Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, who stands outside of history and creation, is able to carry and sustain the weight of your life from womb to tomb, from cradle to grave. He is above the limitations and the changes and the weaknesses that cause each one of us to stumble and fall. He's never outwitted. He's never outsmarted. He's never outworked by anything in all of creation, though time slowly erodes our power and our wisdom and the wealth of man, one true God remains. Community Bible, we never have a, new, uh, have a need for a new God for a new season or a new challenge or a new generation. There is only one true God who is overall, who can sustain us through every season of life that we walk. He never grows old. He's never weakened by time. He's never overwhelmed. He's never confused, caught off guard, trapped in a corner, or dumbfounded. He never needs your power to carry him like the worthless gods of the nations. Instead, all the while, all the time, the one true God carries us. Notice the end of verse 4. I have made and I will bear. I will carry and I will save. I love this verse because it expresses the personal commitment that the Almighty God has for His people. I have made you and I will bear you. Israel did not bring themselves into existence as a people. God says, I will be your God and you will be my people. Their existence came from God and was continued by God. He will provide for his people through every season, every challenge, and every moment of life. The Lord God has committed to sustain the people he's created. I will carry you, he said. And he tells his people, I will save you. The Lord, uh, Israel will be sustained by God and saved by God. There's nothing in this life that can overpower him or thwart his purposes for your life, brothers and sisters. He's able to sustain you no matter what comes against you and any rebellion that comes from you. The maker of heaven and earth knows his people and has promised to save his people. Notice verse 5 and through 7, to whom will you liken me? And make me equal and compare me that we we may be alike. He says, bring all your comparisons. Bring all your idols and compare them to me. You will find there is no one like me. Those who lavish gold from the purse and weigh out silver in the scales, who hire a goldsmith and make it into gold, then they fall down and worship. They lift up on their shoulders, they carry it, they set it in place, and stands there. It cannot move from its place. One cries to it, it does not answer or save from his trouble. Isaiah shows the absurdity of following idols who are nothing more than the work of man's hands and the the graven image of our um, um, imagination. More than the gold of service and purchased by you, gold and silver purchased by you, and formed by human hands. Idols are nothing more. How can something you created save you? It simply can't. And then Isaiah says, look it, they can't, the idols can't even walk from point A to B. They have to be carried. How can something that can't help itself help you? It can't. But as Isaiah is quick to show, the God who stands outside of time and space can carry the weight of your life and can sustain you and empower you and protect you. The psalmist in Psalm 71, verses 17 through 19, put it like this in beautiful prayer. Oh God, from my youth, you have taught me and I still proclaim your wondrous deeds. So even to old age and gray hairs, O oh God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those who come to you. Your righteousness, O oh God, reaches to the heavens. You have not, you, are you ha, who have done great things, O oh God. O oh God, who is like you? And what's the answer? Absolutely no one is like the one true God. For the one true God alone can carry the weights of your life. Therefore, abandon worthless idols, 
trust the eternal God, and third, remember God's salvation. What is the antidote to unbelief in our lives? Memory. To overcome unbelief that we inevitably slip into, we must remember the work that God has done on behalf of his people. Why is that? We so easily become overwhelmed by the circumstances of our life, and we uh, forget the Lord when opposition is strong, when we stand alone, when our mind is overwhelmed, when our emotions oscillate, when our strength is small, when the path is rough. We as a people are so quick to forget what God has done for us and who he is. At our church and our communion table, we literally, like many churches, have carved into the table, do this in remembrance of me. We have to remember the God who we serve, who he is and what he has done. Because if we don't, our forgetfulness will cause us to turn to the worthless idols of our nations that we think we need, and we believe the lies of empty, counterfeit gods, and they trust, when we trust the graven images that we have created in our own imagination. But Isaiah calls us to remember the God they know. Notice verse 8, remember this and stand firm. Recall it to mind, you transgressors. Isaiah calls Israel not to focus on the hopelessness of the circumstances that surrounds them when they don't understand what God is doing or where he is or where he's leading them. Instead, he says, focus and remember the continual faithfulness of the God who always bears and carries his people. To remember is to be deliberate to call to mind the former ways that the Lord has provided for your life. Stand firm, he says. Uh, Eugene Peterson in the Message Bible says, wrap your minds around it. We have to be diligent to remember what the Lord has done. We have to be diligent to fix our attention on the character of God when our mind our flesh, and our enemies bombard us with false accusations, withering doubts, and deceptive emotions that try to lead us away from the character and work of our God. And far too often, we're quick to run after the idols of the world and the counterfeit gods of our hearts. Community Bible, we must work to remember who God is and what He has done. As an aside to this, this morning I explained to the, the, the morning service that the reason we come to worship the more on, on the Lord's Day is to be remembered. We, for six days, have been in the world and we have been formed by the liturgies and the values and the priorities and the directions of the world. And whether we know it or like it or not, those kind of things have transformed us, or conformed us, I should say, to that. And we have to fight against this, this perpetual uh, current that's pulling us. And we are deliberate each Lord's Day to come in here, not solely to bring our worship up, but worship is actually to be conformed to the image of Christ because when we come into worship, God is forming us. Worship is from top down, that we're being reminded that God is in control. That we're being reminded when we confess our sins as a people that we have a basic problem. And we're reminded that we're not hopeless in that problem because we receive the assurance of pardon from the gospel that we read out of the book of Romans today to remind us it's not hopeless and that we're not to despair because Christ is bigger than our enemies. And then we feed on God's word under the authority of God's word and then we're sent out into the community for six days as a light into darkness, but we need to come back and be formed and deformed from the world and be reminded of who God is and what he has done with our brothers and sisters on days when we wake up and we're like, man, I could use an extra two hours of sleep. Matt's not preaching today. This guy from the beach is preaching. It's a good day to sleep in. 
But we remember that we come under the Word where the Holy Spirit conforms us into the image of Jesus. And we are encouraged by the gifts and the, and of our brothers and sisters where we love and conformed like Jesus. And oftentimes we leave worship and like, man, it was hard getting my carcass out of bed this morning, but I am so glad I came because the Spirit formed me into the image of Jesus and helped me remember who God is and what He has done. Brothers and sisters, Isaiah tells us in verse 9 and 10, remember the former things of old. For I am God and there is none other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, from ancient times things not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purpose, calling a bird of prey from the east, the man of counsel from a far country. This is Cyrus, the, the, who would actually bring them, God would use to bring them back to the, uh, Jerusalem. Isaiah is calling his people to not look at the circumstances of their life, the disappointments, the confusion, the struggles. They're in captivity. It's not a lot of fun. But he says, I want you to remember, I want you to go back. Go back before the 70 years of captivity. Go back before the 500 years of the king of Israel. Go back before the 400 years of the judges past the 40 years in the desert, past 400 years in Egypt, past the times of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, past Noah and Enoch, Abe, uh, Abel and Adam, before God created the animals and the fish and the birds and the planets and stars, even before God said, let there be light, as far back as we can go to eternity past, God was and God is and He always will be, brother. Amen. He created all of creation, and all of creation sings His praise. He is not only God of creation, He is Lord of history. He alone has the right to be God. He alone has the right to receive our worship. We simply do not need an idol, for we have the God of creation and the Lord of history. But how quickly we forget. If God can bring order to chaos and light from darkness, breathe life into Adam's lung, deliver his people from the bondage of evil, promise, bring them into the land that he promised, send them into exile. He can deliver and bring his people back from exile. He would raise up Cyrus, a deliverer, who would bring them back from a far country. And they must remember the God who has worked since eternity past is the same God who is leading and guiding carrying and providing for his people. 11 through 13, I have spoken and I will bring it to pass. I have purpose and I will do it. Listen to me, you stubborn of hearts who are far from righteousness. I will bring my righteousness. It is not far off and my salvation will not delay. I will put salvation in Zion my, for Israel my glory. The God who created his people carries his people and declares his purposes for his people and he will complete it. The question that Israel had and the question that each one of us this morning has, will you believe the promises of God? Notice how it refers to Israel. Verse eight, at the 8, you transgressors. In verse 12, you stubborn of heart, you are far from righteousness. Far too often, Israel failed to trust the character of God. And they wandered, and they turned to the gods of, their nation, of the nations, and they turned to the gods of, the, of the, the carvings of their own heart that were made in their own image. They trusted their sense of right and wrong. They refused to believe the one true God. How could, a God, like, uh, uh, how could God use a man like Cyrus? How could God be in control of the Babylonians? How could God send us into captivity? Isaiah's words were meant to shake the people from out of the very, the, one of the most vi, um, dangerous states of mind, self-reliance. We are, they were trusting their wisdom. They were trusting their strength. They were trusting their power. And what was it doing? It was destroying them. Community Bible 
We can be guilty of the same cynicism and stubbornness. We look at the world and we see poverty, corruption, oppression, and injustice. Our churches are not safe from the ravages of sin. C- clergy are corrupt. And let me just say, you are so blessed for pastors like Matt and Joseph. Um, I've seen behind the scenes and I've seen their hearts and they love Jesus, they love their wives, and they love y'all. But churches, that's just not like uh, the rest of the the, the world, where in my own um, denomination, greedy committee members um, exploited those who had been the victims of abuse because they were afraid of potential lawsuits against the church, where political members, rather than know more about the gospel according to Trump and the gospel according to Biden than the gospel according to Jesus Christ, our government is not safe. There's dirty politics politicians and corrupt lobbyists and reactionary voters. Our schools are not safe. Overreaching school boards and prideful parents and deranged shooters who find pleasure in in taking the lives of these little innocent boys and girls. We live in a world that's not supposed to be. And what do we do? Do we turn to the idols? Do I tur- pull ourselves up by our own bootstraps? Or we turn to the one true God who is working in us and through us to glorify himself and to make himself known. The great words of I- uh, Isaac Watts, O oh God, our help in ages past, our hope in years to come, our shelter from the stormy blast, or, and our eternal home. Under the shadow of his throne, your saints have dwelt secure. Sufficient is your arm alone. And our defense is sure. Like Israel, we need to be reminded of God's work in our lives. We need to remember who God is and what he has done and what he is doing. We may not be living in exile in a foreign land, but we're living in a world that is desperately broken by sin, a world that is not our home. But the good news of great joy for all people is this. God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son, that whosoever should believe in him, and he took and he died as to give his life as a man, ransom for many, and all who trust in Jesus, who are united him by faith alone in the work that he, who he is and what he has done, are being led through this spiritual exile to a new Jerusalem, a place that all tears and sorrow and death will be thrown into the pit. And as Paul says, we will always be with the Lord. And the confidence that we have that Paul says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, we have a God in, who in Christ is cre- had created us, has sustained us, he's rescuing us, uh, he's providing for all who come to him through faith in Jesus Christ. Will you believe? Now you, may, you might say, well, Pastor Chris, I'm here because I love Jesus. I, I repented and believed the, the first time. The hour I first believe, as the hymn says. Repenting and believing is a daily activity. As Luther says, the Christian life is to be a call of repentance. And Jesus says to repent and believe and enter my kingdom. To repent is to renounce the throne of your heart to renounce self-reliance and self-love and self-sufficiency and self-glory and self-worship, to, to repent and rid yourself of the sin of pride and to put that to death. But it's, uh, we're called to repent and we're called to believe. To trust the gospel that says, Jesus came my soul to save to save me from my sin and give me new life in Christ, to take my sin upon him on the cross and to give me his righteousness, this double imputation that says, when the Father looked at the cross, he saw my sin, and now when I stand before Almighty God, he doesn't see me. He doesn't see anything I've done. He sees Jesus, and we can say, I belong to Jesus. And we have to remember that day after day after day, no matter what we face. When our resources are low, when our strength is depleted, when our emotions are frail, when our path is dark, we remember the God who created us, who carries us, 
is the God who says he will save us on that day. There'll never be a day, a month, or a season when we are not dependent on the great I am, who is self-existence and self-dependent and unchanging, the God of Israel who sent Christ to redeem us from our sin and give us his righteousness that we may have peace with God. So therefore, I call you each to do the abandon worthless idols. Recognize the areas where you're prone to wander, where you're prone to go and put your trust in the idols of the world and the idols of your heart. To trust the promises of the eternal God, no matter what season you face. Because the the idols of childhood are not the idols of being a young adult or young family or middle age or retirement. The the, The idols of this world change as our lives change, but there is one God who is over us and cares for us, and he gives his promise that he will carry us. And then remember God's salvation. Every day, reminding yourself and fighting against yourself, putting to death your right to claim on your life and trusting in the promises of the God who is greater and bigger than your life and all of creation. And remember, brothers and sisters, the Lord Jesus Christ alone can carry the weight of your life. Shall we pray? Gracious Heavenly Father, we come to you and we thank you for who you are and what you have done. Father, it's so easy we see in our lives to follow the idols of this world, to put our trust in what we can see and what we can understand and what we can touch with our hands. But Father, we see your promises. We see what, who you are and what you have done. We see the gift of Christ, God coming and dwelling with us. And as we celebrated last week, Pentecost Sunday, the gift of your Spirit that dwells within us. Father, may we identify the idols of our hearts. May we pour in the promises of God into our hearts. And may we remember each day to repent and believe Until that day you call us home or you return, now in the grace of Christ we stand.